Good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Kramer. I'm the Assistant University Librarian and the Chief Technology Strategist at Stanford University Libraries. Um, and uh, before we begin, I'd really like to thank our, our host, Mylan, uh, uh, and the entire staff at MoMA, and also Metro, who are the volunteers staffing the tables upstairs. Um, I was just talking to Jennifer Vinopal in the hall, and she said, my God, a conference in New York City, this is a first. Um, no one ever comes here, and after trying to schedule an event, I understand why now. <laughs> um, that said, this facility and the staff have been absolutely outstanding, and if we could only get it all week, uh, Mylan, we'd be willing to come back. But uh, th thank you very much. It, it really is a, um, a wonderful venue. Um, before we begin, uh, Mylan talked about uh, inter uh, interoperable, interoperable image delivery on the web. How many people think they know what that means? All the editors should be raising their hands. <laughs> OK, or at least one take at it. How many people have been, so that, that's about a quarter of the people. How many people uh, have been to a IIIF event before? So maybe about 20%, 15 to 20%. How many people are from New York? Okay, well, I'm glad we came. Um, and how many people are from overseas? All right, so it's a, it's a good uh, five to 10%. Well, well, thank you all for coming. Um, one of the eyes for IIIF is international, and I think we'll see some, throughout the day, a very good lineup of not only what the framework does, but also how it's been applied, not only in the US, but worldwide. Um, well, as you may have noticed on the schedule, there are two opportunities for question and answer sessions throughout the day. And one of the things you will learn, hopefully you will continue to engage in IIIF as we move forward, it is a very community-based uh, and grassroots effort. So if you have any questions, if you have input, if you have suggestions, we very much welcome those. There is, at this point, no central staff that is actually running IIIF. It has not been designed by some uh, higher agency and handed down. It has been done by people like those in this room. Um, so as you think about today, what are the things you really want to learn? What are the things you want to walk away from? And if you don't get to that by the, the break right around lunch and the break in the afternoon, um, please be willing to go ahead and just uh, stick your hand up. So I want to start with a story. Um, and it, it's a story that actually is based on real life, and it, it's happened uh, more than once. So um, once upon a time, there was a website. It was built by very clever, dedicated people with unique, priceless images. It was beautiful, and it was one of a kind. No, literally, it was one of a kind. It had its own image server, it had its own deep zoom, it had its own page turner, Really, there weren't a lot of things to look at when this thing was built, so the people building it made it up as they went. And the whole thing was a snowflake, really. And it was slow. Um, you can see the tile that's missing isn't a typo, it's, it's waiting to load. Um, and it was taxing to build, and it's hard to maintain, and it's hard to enhance, even to this day. And lo and behold, despite all of these flaws that one could see from the inside, People came to the website, and they liked it. They really liked it. They wanted to use it. They liked it so much, they wanted even more. They wanted tools they'd seen on other websites. Uh, they wanted content from other sources. Uh, they wanted to be able to do things like site content, to be able to share content, to be able to download without ha talking to a site administrator or a content curator. They wanted to be able to run image analytics and algorithmic software on top of the content base. They wanted to be able to annotate it. All things that the clever people liked as ideas, but hadn't had the cycles or the capacity to build in. And so the clever people who made the site thought to themselves that they would use the tools and the content that others had built. Surely others had walked this path and we could just integrate with them, um, but they couldn't. Because as it turns out, everyone else who had built a site had done the same thing that they had. And all the websites were different, but in fact, they were all the same. They were all snowflakes. This is what we think image interoperability is meant to address. This is, this is a real story. Uh, this is uh, something that has happened um, not only in our personal experience, but with many institutions that we have worked with. 
And I believe it's probably happening at most of your institutions, if not all of your institutions. Uh, if not now, th then previously, or perhaps in the future. And uh, this is where the grassroots uh, movement for IIIF was born, is how can we do better? The fundamental premise for IIIF is that images are in fact fundamental information carriers of the web. Um, they hold information about things like museum objects, uh, information extracted from books, from manuscripts, from archival materials, uh, maps, newspapers, musical scores, art and visual resources, architecture, uh, even uh, science technology uh, and in engineering med uh, imagery. But really, if you look at the state of image delivery on the web, or especially from the cultural heritage sector, um, image delivery is actually, it's hard. Um, it tends to be a bit slow. It's a bit idiosyncratic. It's definitely disjointed as you move from site to site. And it's often, um, sadly, ugly, at least for the nonprofit sector. You can tell that many of us don't make money uh, and aren't driven by making money. And we all suffer because of it. Um, the, the repositories and the institutions who provide the content uh, suffer because they spend lots of energy and an investment trying to make things current. Um, the technology providers and the technology vendors suffer because what they do for one site is not necessarily portable to others. And uh, arguably, the ones who suffer most of all are the users uh, because they have to cope with this confusing morass of, of subpar functionality. So imagine a different world. What if deep zoom were standard and fast? This is a scroll from Princeton University Library using the Loris image server. I expect you'll be seeing this, if not today, then in the next few days. And what if that were possible with even the largest of images? Uh, this is an 11 foot by 17 foot map digitized at Stanford. Our lead photographer, uh, Wayne Vanderkill, is standing next to it. Wayne is six foot four inches tall. Uh, it gives you a sense. The map is actually a Japanese tax map. It was designed so as you stood in the center of it, you could read uh, the, the tax provinces and the rates around, and you could just turn around in a circle. Um, what if you could actually compare images from across sites? So not just at your institution or your repository, but from any arbitrary set of repositories to do comparison. In this case, a self-portrait of, of Van Gogh from um, for Gauguin from Harvard's collections, or a Caligat painting from Burba, Burma in the 18th century that's held at the digital uh, Bodleian at Oxford. What if you could collect items that belong together? Um, in this case, not Otto Ege and Dr. Ben Albritton, the digital curator uh, at Stanford for digital medieval manuscripts, um, but repairing some of the work that Otto Ege did as a biblioclast. If you're not familiar with a biblioclast, it's one who tears pages from or otherwise destroys books. So it turned out in uh, the 1940s, Otto Ege lived in Ohio and made a living by acquiring whole manuscripts and stripping out the folios or the leaves and then selling them piecemeal uh, to different sites across uh, his distribution network. And uh, for what uh, Dr. Albritton has now reconstructed, uh, while there was one manuscript in 1940 located, there are now 40 to 50 um, different individual holding sites for the leaves from what he's dubbed Otto Ege number one, manuscript number one, um, held in different states with different technology platforms um, and with different organizational concerns. Given the power of IIIF, it's actually now possible to, to unify this with in this re virtual reconstruction, it, page images being dynamically served with no incremental effort from uh, most of the partners from South Carolina, California, North Carolina, and the states of Mississippi. What if you could search within content, so not just view it, but actually look at the full text search, uh, look at the full text and search across it? What if you could cite and share images? Uh, in this case, a picture of Martin Luther King with Joan Baez and a march to integrate the schools in Granada, Mississippi in 1966. Um, and what if you could not just uh, send a complete image, but what if you could highlight a region of interest uh, and be able to send uh, that specific region of interest in a way that was manipulable, citable, shareable, and viewable by people in independent environments? What if you could analyze images? What if you could superimpose them into things like uh, geographic information systems to do things like georeferencing or georectification, which is what Clocan Technologies Georeferencer does with this map from the National Library of Scotland? 
What if you could annotate images? Uh, the Diva.js uh, document viewer is actually built, it does full documents, but it's built specifically for the study of music and musicology, and in this case, um, extensive markup of, of uh, musical forms. And what if you could do all of this with the applications of your choice? Uh, in this case, this is a screenshot from the Qatar Digital Library, and they have built um, their own interface and their own uh, viewer, but they've made their site completely IIIF compatible, and in a demonstration um, provided by CogApp, you can actually go to the exact same resource, in this case an archival letter, that's served up by three different interoperable image viewers. Uh, so Mirador, the universal viewer, and the Internet Archives book reader. All from the same site with no additional programming. What would all of this do? Would it open up new perspectives, uh, as we're beginning to see with this uh, IIIF powered display? Um, at the Fogg Museum at Harvard uh, with Rashmi Singhal, who was one of our uh, lead developers for Mirador. And what if all this were possible now? So what if you didn't have to wait? What if this wasn't some bold future uh, that, that would eventually evolve? What if this were something that IIIF was providing right now? Because in fact it is. So IIIF, the vision for uh, it is to create a global framework by which image-based resources of any type, uh, images, books, maps, scrolls, manuscripts, newspapers, you name it, from any participating institution can be delivered in a standard way. And once that happens, um, it lets you open up to using any compatible image server for display, manipulation, and annotation in any application available to any user on the web. So it's really that simple, but once it boils down to that, it opens up all sorts of possibilities. What if further IIIF were supported by a leading consortium of uh, world-class uh, research and cultural heritage institutions? What if they combined and exposed their collective holdings numbering in the tens of millions of high-quality, well-described, uh, rich cultural resources and digital objects? And what if you could use all of those objects with a rich and growing suite of software tools that were backed by the best of current image delivery technology and all using uh, uh, current web standards? So what is IIIF? We think of IIIF as being four distinct things. There is a fifth item that is, that is trying to cut its way in to the canon of the four, which you'll hear about later today. Um, but we think of it as, first and foremost, it's a community of people who have agreed to work together to uh, tackle these common problems. And really the common problem, the main solution and the main approach is to focus on the development of shared APIs or application programming interfaces. This is the absolute keystone to the entire approach because that then lets people uh, open up to implement implementing valuable solutions in various different software platforms of their choice and exposes a wealth of interoperable content. So not only is there software, but there's material to actually use, do research on, view, and consume. To dive a little bit deeper um, into each one of these elements. So first of all, IIIF is a community. Uh, at this point, I was popping pinpricks into the map last night. Um, oh, it's still at a reasonable hour in California. Um, and uh, I think we're up to over 70 or 80 known participating institutions within IIIF. And in fact, I, it's now spanning uh, four or five continents. I won't count in public, and I'll move on so you can't see how many there actually are. Um, and it's composed of a, a growing number of international leaders in a variety of spaces. We have a, approaching 15 state and national libraries. We have some of the world's re leading research institutions. We have a growing number of technology firms, uh, in many cases small and very nimble, who are doing absolutely compelling work. Uh, we have uh, actually a much larger list of museums, and this is one of the major growth areas uh, that we're expecting to see for IIIF in the next year or two. We have a growing number of aggregators, such as ArtStore, the Digital Public Library of America, Europeana, and the Internet Archive. And what we're seeing is some of the biggest beneficiaries to IIIF are not necessarily major institutions, but they're, more, they're smaller, more lightweight projects who need to get in, get something done, and get out without building a ton of infrastructure or spending years doing content acquisition and content exposure. 
AAAF was formally organized in 2012 when a group of about uh, eight libraries gathered together at, in Cambridge University and populated what was then the AAAF discuss list with I think 27 members. Um, over the years, we've seen basically a doubling in growth each year, geomet geometric progression. Uh, with this year, uh, we're uh, just a little bit over four months into the year, uh, we're already over 400 uh, subscribers, and at a projected rate, we'll, we'll break more than 600 in the next year. And this, as I mentioned before, is really the key to AAAF's growth. It is community powered. Uh, the entire endeavor is based on open calls, open email lists, email lists, and collaborative development of both technology and practice. This is a group of people who have come together to try to solve the problem in the same way and, and committed to communicating with each other. In the last year, we've also established more formal working groups in areas of specific concern. So we now have working groups for manuscripts, for museums, for newspapers, uh, a group that works with the editors on ongoing technical specification and proving, uh, and a couple of different groups involved in uh, viewer development. We also have more groups that are beginning to spin up. Uh, so just last month we had our first meeting for ext the extension of IIIF into AV, or audiovisual material, and there is keen interest among many, many in the IIIF community about actually moving into 3D materials and to be able to render and view 3D materials using the same standards and specifications. These uh, elements and the, some of the participants are laid out on the IIIF.io website under the Community tab. You'll also see how you might want to participate if today's session intrigues you and you want to follow along or chime in. In terms of the technology approach, as I mentioned, the key is really around APIs, uh, so application programming interfaces. And what we found in the story in the, in the beginning was uh, with the picture of the elephant, what we'd really succeeded in building was a very fine silo. And what our colleagues who were doing similar work had succeeded in building was their very own silo with a, almost a complete overlap of functionality but very little shared technology and no way to efficiently share uh, the content or pieces of that. So what, what ends up in that environment is you do have snowflakes and every individual website is a silo. There is no interoperability. Every application development effort ends up being a one-off effort that works with and for your site and for users and only for your site and for your users. There's little portability or little reuse. And then again, every user must come in and cope with the different silos with their technologies, their affordances, and what they can provide. But the thing about the internet is content doesn't all live in one place. That's why it's a network. And so effectively what we've built um, is Siloville. And this is a, this is a wonderful picture, uh, and I think it's, it's very emblematic of how the cultural heritage institution and how technology in general is done, which is you say that you want to cooperate, and this is a big co-op on the side, and then you do whatever you're going to do anyway, and at the very end, maybe you piece together a catwalk that walks across the top. All right, and oftentimes that's like, well, I'll load up a hard drive and I'll sneaker net it over. I will use Internet 3, which is DHL, and we'll get it, we'll get it over to you. So there is a solution to this, um, and one of these solutions is, is application programming interfaces. And so that's instead of building a customized silo that works with its parts and only its parts, you introduce APIs. So that's this middle layer. So it, you're basically standardizing, standardizing the interfaces between different parts of the system. And you can do that and still have a wonderful local application. But the real power of APIs is that you can then use that same environment to talk to many other applications with no additional work from the people in, in blue in this case. Uh, later this afternoon, there'll be a, a, a much deeper dive into APIs from my colleague Rob Sanderson. Uh, but this is essentially the key to IIIF, because once you agree on the APIs, anyone can implement any application they want at the top level, and anyone can implement any image delivery server or any content store they want at the bottom level, because you've agreed on kind of the, the pinch point of the hourglass. So for IIIF, if you've been following it for a while, you'll know probably the two core APIs. These are the image API and the presentation API. And just very briefly, the image API lets you get the pixels of an image more or less via simple RESTful web service. So you can put a URL into a browser bar and you can get pixels back. 
The other part of interoperable image delivery is the presentation API. As many of us know, if you're delivering content over the web, there's more to content than just the picture. Uh, you need to know the structural metadata, you need to know the title, you need to know the, uh, the display labels, uh, you need to know things like attribution and license. Essentially, the presentation API gives you these critical bits so you can consume a resource remotely, yet still know where it came from and know what comes next. Two more APIs that are just beginning to emerge are the search API, uh, which allows for search within an object, so say the full text of a newspaper or the transcription of, um, of an archival material, a piece of archival material, and an authentication API, which allows for login and differentiated access. You'll hear more about these this afternoon. So um, with those APIs, what becomes available and what becomes possible next? So when we started IIIF, we thought the APIs were great and there was a chicken or egg issue, which is we needed content to be exposed so people would write software, which would then get more content to be exposed, which would get more people to write software. And for the first two to three years, we've been through this process of kind of bootstrapping or priming the pump with individual institutions basically taking their own software and making it IIIF compatible. But we're now beginning to see a process of snowballing. And there are, at this point, roughly a dozen uh, IIIF uh, compatible image servers. So if you want to have something that reads an image file from your repository or your local system and deliver it up via standard IIIF APIs, uh, there are a dozen different options. Many of them um, are quite good. Some of them you shouldn't use. <clears throat> um, there are also a fantastic and growing number of image clients. Um, I think one of the things that has really sold IIIF, and maybe which we, we capitalized on um, in a somewhat mercenary fashion, was Open Sea Dragon, which is a fantastic deep zoom client that originated at Microsoft, was open sourced um, and, and ported out, and is one of the things that powers a lot of the deep zoom interfaces. And it is super snazzy. Uh, with the elephant, with the tile that was not loading at the beginning, you would not see that with Open Sea Dragon. Um, there are also a number of other very high quality uh, Zoom clients um, that allow you to do things like look in, look on a mobile device, even overlay annotations. And we're beginning to see a, a number of higher order, more complex applications on top, such as the Universal uh, Viewer, which was developed by Digirati in their work with the uh, uh, Wellcome Foundation and the British Library. Mirador, a comparative viewer, which we'll see later today, the Internet Archive Book Reader, uh, which many people know and love. Uh, Luna Technologies, uh, and DivaJS, which I mentioned earlier. So in fact, when we talk about why IIIF, you might want to ask yourself, why not IIIF? Would you take extra effort to try to come up with something that wasn't compatible? The last key element of IIIF is, uh, is not just having the software, but exposing uh, a bunch of content upon which uh, the actual images, which are interoperable. And um, given the open nature of the community, this is actually something that's a little bit hard to track. Um, but if you're on IIIF Discuss, uh, about every two to three weeks, a new institution writes in and says, oh, by the way, we just opened up our IIIF server and we now have 500,000 images that are now online and openly available on the web using IIIF, which was the case with the Guitar Digital Library. Or you could look at the University of British Columbia, uh, which did something similar with, I think, approaching 200,000 image-based resources. They don't use any of, they have their own image delivery software, but when they looked at IIIF and the APIs on the back end, they said, these make so much sense, we're gonna use these APIs even though we're doing our own thing with our own technology in the front. Uh, the World Digital Library last week put out a very, um, uh, Washington message that you could find IIIF on the World Digital Library site, but it was not officially supported, and they're continuing to roll additional materials in. If you're not familiar with the World Digital Library, it's something that the Library of Congress has been spearheading for the last uh, many years, and it is some of the highest quality and richest content that you'll find in any digital library um, around, uh, and now exposed via IIIF. University of College Dublin did something very similar to University of British Columbia. They ended up exposing IIIF APIs on their back end. Um, and then uh, last September or last October, the Internet Archive announced the largest exposure to date with 9.3 million digital objects uh, amounting to hundreds of millions of in individual digital files, all available via IIIF. And the march just continues. So at this point, 
we believe that there are um, in the hundreds of millions of uh, digital objects and image files that are available via AAAF on the web. So what does all this mean, and how do we, how do we know that more are coming? Um, so if you look at Twitter, uh, the American Art Collaborative uh, is a project that has received um, uh, IMLS and I believe Mellon funding, and they're using AAAF uh, and linked data uh, to actually knit together the collections of 15 different art institutions um, across the US. The 9.3 million um, books and images available through the Internet Archive were announced. Um, from the pages, uh, or from the page is a transcription application that, that's being built by Ben Frum Brunfeld in Texas. Uh, with IIIF, he can now take his, manif his um, transcriptions and his images that he's done in his own software, port them into IIIF, and they can be viewed in any viewer. Uh, Luna Software uh, last December announced that they were officially supporting IIIF now that it had reached a sufficient state of maturity and interest within the market. So that's great. A lot of people are climbing on board, um, but what's in it for me? That's probably what you're asking yourself, because this is New York, and that's New Yorkers are brash and to the point. So, New York, this is what's in it for you. Um, so Francisco Frey from Harvard. Um, has one of the best quotes, I think, about what IIIF does. Um, it's like going from the 18th century to the 21st century with a, in a single click. It's going from that um, slow tile load elephant to something with a super fast and slippy deep zoom. Glenn Robson from the National Library of Wales says, IIIF is good for us. IIIF is also good for sharing. Richard Higgins at Durham University says, IIIF doesn't just keep you out of silos, it keeps you out of dead ends. It keeps you from going down um, technology paths that you can't get out of. It also keeps you going down from content paths and, and getting it locked up in a cul-de-sac. So what does IIIF provide? Um, in summary, it's good for you. It gives you rich image delivery, and you'll see some live examples of that uh, today. It gives you plug and play server and client software. Use any back end, use any front end, switch them at any time. Um, really, you're the boss. That goes over well in New York. Um, one of the things it also gives you is the ability to publish your images to the internet, and because people can consume them via URL, they don't need to download them. And there are all sorts of advantages to this, especially when you're working with large images, but not only when you're working with large images. So if uh, you want to, as a site, if you want to keep control of your images, if you want to update the metadata, if you want to put out an enhanced image later on, you can do all that without IIIF. You actually get more control by putting your images online with IIIF than you do even a smaller mid-range um, delivery surrogate. It also supports attribution and access control. So if uh, we'll have a panel about open access a little bit later today, uh, IIIF supports open access. IIIF also supports uh, uh, controlled access. If you want to put materials up, there is nothing about the standard that says you can't keep control of your materials as it goes online. IIIF is also good for sharing. So you can remix content from other people. You can cite and share, as you've seen. Um, it's annotation friendly. So you can do markup, and you can actually port that markup from system to system um, and over time and keep control not only of your images, uh, but also the, the analysis and the enrichment that you've done. And finally, and most importantly, I think IIIF is part of a global network. It's a community of people like those in this room who are trying to figure out how to do something at scale and at mass, really leveraging the internet instead of coming up with, again, a bunch of different snowflakes. So here are some of the, uh, the, the things that have come out on Twitter about why IIIF. Um, so IIIF means you, images to your specs, resize, flip, select regions, or format. Um, IIIF and Mirador are thrilling together. IIIF makes your image-based resources mash upable. Um, McGill, in this case university, can make your content more useful while you still host it. So again, this is notion if you expose it, other people can consume and enrich it uh, without necessarily downloading it. This is what IIIF.io enables. I really like this model of layering on services. I think the most important characteristics for IIIF, though, are these middle two. Um, one is that IIIF future-proofs the delivery of your images. You can do something now, and uh, even with changes in technology, changes in policy, uh, or a growth in your content base, IIIF lets you have a continuity of service and a continuity of planning. The second is because a lot of thought has gone into it and many hands with many different concerns have helped shape it, IIIF is the answer for questions you didn't even know that you had. 
So that's a brief introduction to AAAF. You'll actually see it in action throughout the rest of the day. And as you go, I would ask you, especially if you've not seen it before, to think about these questions and maybe bring them up during the Q&A session. So one is, is, how can AAAF apply to you? What collections or content would you like to see exposed via AAAF, perhaps at your own institution or perhaps at a different institution? What software do you have or do you want to have uh, that should be AAAF compatible? And what should AAAF do that it doesn't do yet? What will really make it, uh, help it take its next leap? So with that, uh, I will turn it over uh, to our next set of speakers. Thank you very much.